I'm Charlotte Kirk, and you're listening to Fascination Street Podcast. Yeah! AV in your ears, the amp was being giving you this audio visual down the most interesting street in the world with my boy Steve, Fascination Street. You already know. Let's get it when you whip in the Fascination Street. What do you say? Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Corinne Britty. Corinne is an actress and a comedian, but mostly an actress, and sometimes a comedian, but mostly an actress. In this episode, we talk about her journey, some of the things that she learned at NYU Tisch, and a lot of the things that she didn't. And we also talk about some of the projects that she's been involved with, (laughs) and some fun audition stories that go along with those. We touch on a live comedy slash therapy show that she was a part of and is currently on hiatus over in New York City, but hopefully it'll come back. And she tells an awesome story about working on a project for the great Ice-T, the legend Ice-T. And then finally, we talk about her new film, Saturday Night. It's in theaters right now. It is a movie about the pilot episode of Saturday Night Live. Corinne plays real-life comedian Valerie Bromfield, and we talk a little bit about her. We talk about the movie. We talk about working with Jason Reitman, the director and the co-writer. She shares some of the differences between working on a smaller indie film and a big-budget film. Saturday Night is the biggest-budget project that she has worked on so far. Be sure to check out some of Corinne's previous projects, including Route 80, For Sale, Take Care of Emily, and Condor's Nest. But most importantly, go check out Saturday Night. It's in theaters right now. And this is my conversation with actress, comedian, but mostly actress, Corinne Britty. Prepare to be fascinated. Prepare to be fascinated. Prepare to be fascinated. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Corinne Britty. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I cannot complain. So, Corinne, what I like to do is I like to start from the beginning. It helps us understand how the guests got from where they were to where they are. So where were you born and raised? Where'd you grow up? I was born in D.C., raised partially there and then partially North Carolina. I guess my most formative years were probably in North Carolina. So that's where I say I'm like originally from. But I've actually spent longer in New York than I have anywhere else in my whole life. So I think I can say that I'm a New Yorker. A New Yorker. Mm Mm-hmm. So why D.C.? And was it actually D.C. or was it like Maryland? It was D.C. specifically is where I lived for the first couple years of my life. And then Cabin John, Maryland, very small little area. Nope, that's not a real place. (laughs) I guess you're going to have to Google it later. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very tiny little town near Bethesda. We moved after I finished elementary school. So I don't remember a whole lot about that area. My daughter was born in Bethesda. Why did you move to North Carolina and whereabouts? It was my dad's job. We moved to Winston-Salem. And my parents met in D.C., so that's why I was born there. Ah. Yeah, my dad's job. And then, yeah, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Sometimes when I say I'm from Winston-Salem... People just hear the the Salem part and they're like, oh, what did you love about living in Massachusetts? And I'm like, nope, that's wrong. Could not be further. It's Winston dash Salem is where I'm from. Not much interesting happening in that town. I wish we burned witches there, but no. Wow. She said, I wish. Yeah. So Winston Salem is her NASCAR or something over there at least? Oh, NASCAR for sure. Yeah. I mean, nothing interesting to me is really what I mean. Oh, sure. No, I get that. There's stuff happening, (laughs) but it was not for me. (laughs) (laughs) So when did you decide that you wanted to get into acting? I mean, I guess like a part of me, like always really loved that. Like as soon as I got into, you know, doing theater and stuff in school when I was a kid, I knew I really loved it. But it being a job, like never, I never even considered that until I actually applied everywhere in terms of colleges. I applied like to all these other schools besides NYU for something other than acting. And then I ended up getting into NYU Tisch and I was like, oh, okay, (laughs) actually, maybe, maybe this is something, maybe I can do this. But there weren't a lot of like resources and outlets in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, certainly not in my high school, which 
almost none of the teachers I talked to about it had any idea about like acting college programs. They weren't focused on that. It was not an art school. I didn't have any like audition coaching or training. I certainly didn't know anything about like monologues and plays besides the ones that we just studied in school. And so I felt like, oh, wow, if I can do this with like little to no resources, like maybe I can pull something together and maybe this can be my job. And then, I, yeah, that was like the moment where I was like, oh, OK, actually, I don't think I can do anything else. <laughs> A lot of parents have specific thoughts about what they want for their kids. Mm -hmm. What did your parents say when you said, hey, you know what I want to do? I want to pretend for a living. My parents were actually very supportive. That's like one thing that I feel really, really lucky for is that at least to me, they were always very supportive and, you know, encouraging of me kind of pursuing my dreams, which is not the norm. I went to school with plenty of kids who were like, my parents can afford to send me here, but they refused. They cut me off. And so I have to work two jobs to like put myself through acting school, which is really cool but not me. <laughs> the first time I ever interviewed somebody who went to Tish, I put it in like the show notes, you know, that we talked about her time at Tish. Mm -hmm. And immediately, like an hour after the episode was released, she was blowing up my email being like, you dumbass, you spelled Tish wrong. And I was like, calm down. I'm so sorry. Like, relax. <laughs> I would never do that. So <laughs> You can spell it as wrong as you want. You can throw in <laughs> as many letters as you feel in there. Um, I don't really care. I, I just thought it was hilarious. I was like, that's crazy. Yeah. Calm down, lady. Calm down. Oddly enough, uh, she, she never came back on the show. Weird. <laughs> okay. So you went to acting school. I always like to talk to people who went to acting school because I'm curious about how acting school is. Like I, I know that, well, some of the people that I've talked to in acting school, they don't really talk a lot about after you get out of acting school. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, not at all. Yeah. What was the biggest surprise for you between like, you know, what you were learning in school and then real world application of trying to apply your trade? What I think is crazy, they don't really talk about how to like be a working actor in the business at all. They teach you how to act like once you have a job, they teach you how to like build a role and like they teach you all the fun artistic stuff that you don't actually get to do that often in acting life. And the majority of your technique as an actor is spent auditioning. Some actors, like even working established actors, they book like one thing a year, if that. I think that was like the biggest shock to me, at least like I was lucky. I went I went into a four year program where they taught mainly theater. And then I actually ended up leaving after the third year and doing a film conservatory, which I am so thankful for because they don't care about the artistic side at all, at least at the at the one that I went to. They were like, you bring your own technique, you bring your own thing to it. We're going to get you in front of the camera and we're going to basically do audition drills like how auditions would actually be happening in the real world. Like at the time that I was in school, they were still saying like, have your two contrasting monologues and make sure your headshot is pretty, you know, like audition technique classes were taught by teachers who hadn't auditioned in 20 years. We certainly didn't get any self tape training <laughs> over there, which is like how the majority of auditions are going, especially now, like even before 2020, I was doing mostly self-tapes. Those were the majority of the initial audition. So the industry was already leaning toward self-tapes long before COVID? Yeah, I mean, at least at my level, for sure. I was auditioning for mainly like independent film, like very, very independent films and like non-union things and like commercials and things. And like commercials, they don't even want to waste money on studio space. And so they're like, we'll do that for the callback, but... For the initial self tape, they're looking at like two, three, four hundred people, and they're like, "I don't want to do <laughs> that." Would take several days to do all that versus like just sending in a tape. And nowadays, the callbacks are all over Zoom, of course. But before that, it was majority self tapes. And if I hadn't gone to that film conservatory and like learned how to put myself on tape, it would have taken me a lot longer to kind of figure that out. Unless I, you know, happen to get lucky. So this conservatory was it Stone Street? 
Yeah, it was. Well, whose idea was it for you to go there? And how did you find this? Because that seems to be like the largest missing piece of an education in acting. Yeah. How did you find it? Whose idea was it? I think some classmates had left early and gone. I don't know why it was. The, I think it was just like, you know, classmates of theirs had left and, and gone there. And I did like a summer program with them over two weeks. And I was like, actually, I think this is what I need to be learning instead of doing more theater. Although it would have been lovely and fun. I And like, you know, I would have been able to like hang out with my classmates. I really felt like I needed to learn more about the actual business. Did you ever go back to Tish? Well, I mean, I graduated early and so okay. no. <laughs> so yeah, so you graduated. Okay, cool. Yeah. Do you find that one of the most important aspects of going to an acting school is the networking and the connections that you make while you're there? Have you found that to be true yet? Yes and no. I mean, I think a lot of really great famous collaborators met that way. And I think that's really valuable. And certainly like a lot of my friends that I'm still friends with now I met in in college. But I think the value is like, at least for me coming from, you know, I didn't come from a performance art high school. I didn't come from a robust theater program. I didn't really get to kind of like stretch my artistic imagination and like really learn what I can do as an actor. And I think that's also really important. I mean, that's at least what I mostly got out of it. I met a few people that, you know, I've collaborated with in the past there. I think that's really valuable. But I think one thing that is like egregiously missing from conservatory programs in general is like acting business boot camp. And I think a lot of reasons they don't offer it is because it's not fun. <laughs> it's like, you know, you really do have to kind of really come to terms with like how you look as a person. It's like very visual, especially commercials and things. And like, it's not easy because it is a business. It's not really fun, but it's actually insane that they still are making people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on an education and then they're leaving school. And I would say about 50% of the people that I went to acting school with like got into the business, realized they hated it, and then went back to grad school to do something completely different. So do you think that they hated it because it's not the fantasy that they imagined? Like they thought it was going to be, you know, I get to act for two, three, eight hours a day. And, and really, they get to act for two, three, four minutes at a time. Yeah, pretty much. I think a lot of people know intellectually, like, yeah, I'm going to be mainly auditioning. I'm not going to have the opportunity to like be in productions all the time and be cast in something all the time. But then when you actually get down to it and you're like, you know, first starting out and you don't have an agent, you don't have representation at all. If you're, you know, some kids did leave school with representation, but not all, you know, and so if you're not lucky, I was one of the people I didn't have representation when I left school, even though I auditioned in front of a lot of them. I just didn't get lucky. I didn't get signed. And so, you know, you're on backstage.com. You like you spend whatever. It's like $100 for a year subscription and you like put yourself out there and you're submitting yourself every day. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of admin. That's not very fun. And then if you get an audition, it's for like a student film. I was doing a lot of those. It's for like local theater productions that don't pay anything or pay a stipend of $100. I've done that before where it's like a month of rehearsals and work and like taking off from my actual day job and doing that. Yeah, I think it's like it's very disheartening when you're like, I had so much fun in school and I felt really fulfilled and really like I had this really great outlet and then I got out into the real world and like either you have to create that outlet for yourself and spend time, effort and money that you don't have on that or you go back and do something else that you find what else is fulfilling in your life. And I think that's the choice that a lot of my classmates ended up making. Having said all of that... <laughs> Yeah. Why are you still an actress? Um, I don't know. Delusion, I think. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. And nice. Just, like, I grinded and still am a lot. I think I, I eventually I kind of got used to the grind and like I'm now like represented. I have, you know, and I have like 
I worked a good amount. And like, I don't know, I, I think like every job has allowed me to feel just a little bit more and more validated as time goes on and be like, okay, yeah, there's some people who like really like what I do. So, you know, I think I can at least see if I can't make a living out of this. But yeah, in those beginning years, it was like mainly delusion, which I think is healthy. I think you should like believe in yourself a little bit, you know, with even if you don't have anyone like validating that yet, <laughs> you should believe in yourself. I was like, I don't, I really don't think I can do anything else. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Murray River Salt USA, Australia's only naturally pink salt. What makes Murray River Salt so good? Murray River Salt is sourced from the Murray Darling Basin in Australia and is prized for its unique flavor, its delicate texture, its high mineral content, and it's kosher certified. Awarded for superior taste by the International Taste Institute, it's highly sought after by chefs and food enthusiasts alike. Naturally different with two thirds less sodium per teaspoon, no dextrose, no chemicals, no pesticides, and Murray River's high mineral content not only enhances the flavor but also contributes to its health benefits. And it contains a range of trace minerals like magnesium, calcium, and potassium. This pristine saline water source has been trapped underground for thousands of years and has not been exposed to the elements until it is pumped up for salt production, where the brine is solar evaporated and crystallizes over the summer months. Murray River Salt comes in a variety of options, from pouches to canisters, boxes, and even gift sets for that chef or foodie in your life. Finally, Australia's only naturally pink salt is available here in the United States. For 10% off your order, go to murrayriversaltusa.com and use the code FSP10 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off your whole order at murrayriversaltusa.com with the promo code FSP10. And remember, it's perfect for any dish, so sprinkle it on your food as a finishing salt for a hydrating boost of electrolytes, throw it in some water, and it's great for margaritas too. Everything tastes better with Murray River Salt. Let's get back into it. So where do you think you got the perseverance and the confidence to not quit? I mean, you know, like you said, Probably half of the people that you went to school with yeah. were like, hey, this ain't for me. And then they went to do something else. So mm -hmm. where do you think you got that grit? I don't know. I mean, like, I really don't, <laughs> I don't think it's like more complicated than like delusion and like truly without a doubt, I believe like there's a spot for me here in the industry, but also like, I don't know, my parents were, you know, the first people in their families to get their college degrees and my mom made the decision to stay at home for the majority of, you know, my, my brother's life to like take care of us. Uh, and my dad was kind of the breadwinner for a long time, but my mom was never the type of person who wasn't always having something else going on. She was like, my, my life is not just going to be homemaker. Although I think that's really, you know, a beautiful, noble thing. She had a slew of businesses that like reached a decent amount of success you know, by the time we were old enough to kind of like use the stove and like, you know, wash ourselves, like she was out pounding the pavement even before like advertising yourself on the internet was a big thing. She was really investing time, energy and effort into, you know, she was a, an interior decorator for a long time and she was really investing a lot of time and effort into that. And she, she worked a lot because of it. It wasn't like she was always looking for that next get rich quick thing or looking for that extra income. She was always like, this is, I need something outside of my home life that can fuel me. I think, and I, I think I, I've gotten a little bit of that in my genes. I'm like, I need something else besides my day job <laughs> to get me through. And I don't know. Yeah. I've always just been like, okay, that's the work. The amount of work that I needed to do, like the pounding the pavement, the submitting yourself, the updating, you know, all of your casting sites and spending money on headshots, none of that felt so insurmountable to me 
that it wasn't worth it. Like that only seemed well worth it for, you know, booking the job, at least for me. You've mentioned headshots a few times, not to sound like an ignorant fool, but uh-huh. are we still doing headshots? Like, are we still paying a photographer to take a picture? Yeah, you have it's still to. a thing. Really? You don't have to print them out anymore, but it's like digitally. It's become its own industry. It used to be just like a picture of your face. They just needed to see what you look like. But now it's like its own industry. And I don't photograph well. I'm sorry. I'm not a model. And so every time I like I've paid thousands of dollars over the years at this point for headshots. And every single time I've presented them up until my current representation, I presented them to representation. They were like, you're prettier than this. You don't look like your headshot. And I'm like, it actually looks exactly like me because it's my face. (laughs) I don't really understand the note. Sorry. And what are you supposed to do with that note anyway? Nothing. No, it's just insulting. (laughs) It's just nothing. Like, you don't look like it means you have to go back and spend, you know, hundreds of dollars more on more headshots. You really have to like learn how to take a good headshot and like what looks like you versus what looks like a model. It's insane. I hate that I think about it a lot. And like, hopefully for the next little while, I won't have to think about it until you get new headshots. Well, at least you don't have to do that thing like they used to do, where it's like, hey, this is me in a baseball uniform. This is me as a firefighter. You know, like (laughs) there is still some. No, stop that. Some No, truly, there is still some of that. They're like, well, we need picture. It's kind of like more subtle now where it's like you in a dark top and you're scowling and oh, you're so edgy versus you in a bright polka dot dress and you're smiling and you're laughing so hard and having so much fun because you could be in commercials. It's like that, but just more broad. It's like it's not like, look, I play tennis. Or look, here's me as a witch, you know, like it's more just like, here's me happy and cute and quirky. And then here's me serious in a network procedural drama, you know, like it's very much like that. I was talking to a guy who um, is pretty successful in the commercial uh, world. And man, he does a lot of commercials for medications and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. even like print ads and things like that, just like for medications and stuff specifically or procedures or whatever. Mm hmm. And one of the things that he said that surprised him the most was, you know, whenever you're getting your picture taken, no matter what it's for, usually you're, you know, you're smiling, you're trying to, you know, exude that you're a happy person or whatever. And Mm -hmm. he found out that specifically in those instances, the casting directors for those commercials and and those print ads, they're not looking for somebody to smile. Like they're looking for somebody who, this is going to sound weird, but they're looking for somebody who might have been on their feet all day and now their feet hurt. So they're Mm going to sell some shoes or they're looking for somebody who might be in the middle of a constipation episode. So you're not going to be smiling. And I was just like, I never really thought about it like that because I always figured that casting directors, I don't know, knew they were hiring an actor instead of somebody who maybe really did have diarrhea right then or something. I don't know. It's just weird. Especially in the commercial world, they have zero imagination. If they get a headshot of someone and they're not smiling, then they move on to the next one of someone who is smiling. You probably won't even get the audition. It's very insane. So is that part of it that you have to have all these different headshots and then you have to know which one to send in for each part? Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's a huge thing that I had to learn. You have to have like multiple different because like how it works, you know, when you get a breakdown or like when you log on to actorsaccess.com, which is like kind of the industry standard, you see a breakdown and you click on it and you're like, okay, I think I would be good at that. Like you see the, you know, the character description briefly, and then you can click on which headshots you want to send, which video clips you want to send, and then anything you want to type up in the notes. I almost never type up anything in the notes because when I was submitting myself, I would have had to type up, you know, 15, 20 a day. And I can't do that. (laughs) I just don't have the energy. And so you pick your clips, you pick your headshot and you pick your resume. Some people have multiple resumes, a commercial resume, a theater resume, a film resume with like which things are kind of of your credits are kind of at the top. And then you click on that and then you send it off and you have to either pay for each one individually that you submit or you have a subscription. What do you mean pay for each one? 
every submission that you send in, if you don't pay for a yearly subscription to Actors Access, you have to pay like a couple dollars for every submission. <laughs> this is the first time hearing of this. So you have to pay for a job interview? Yeah. That sounds awesome. It's horrible. Yeah. I mean, well, not on top of the headshots. And the acting classes and, you know, making yourself look presentable and rent and utilities and like having a life, seeing a movie, you know, because you have to see movies, you have to go to plays, you have to know what's happening in the industry. You also have to send like there's a yearly subscription, which is always worth it. But if you don't do that, then it's like two or three bucks for every submission. And there could be 15 submissions in a day. That's wild. Yeah. Let's move on to some more fun things. Do you watch the stuff that you're in? Like, do you watch your acting projects? Yeah. Like at the screenings and stuff, you kind of have to, if you're a working actor, because you need to make clips for your reel. I've seen pretty much everything besides like a few commercials of the stuff that I've done. I don't like love it. Unless it's a really cool project that I really believe in. I'm like, you know, I I don't like relish seeing my face on screen. (laughs) Okay. We're going to talk about some of your things. Okay. First, tell me about Almost Therapy. Yeah. Okay. That was like a passion project from me and my friend, Catherine Friel. We wanted to do a comedy show. It's a comedy variety show, which like mostly stand up, but like we have characters, we have drag, we have burlesque, we have magicians, like, and musicians, like anyone we think is cool, we have on the show. And then at the end of the show, we have on a mental health professional, like a real one, not like somebody dressed up and like a comedian answer anonymous questions from the audience. So this is a live event? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. How did you and and your friend decide to start this? Like, why? Why this show and then end it with a, I don't know, a therapy session? Why? Well, both of us were definitely very interested in psychology in college. Uh, I think both of us did like an unofficial minor. We took enough credits or something in psychology to have a minor, but it's not on any paperwork or anything. And we've always been interested in that. And like, I think comedy has a way of healing people for sure. And we like that. And we wanted to create a really cool, I mean, the first motivation was like, we were comedians and we were doing like open mics and like various shows and things, but we didn't really know that many comedians. And like when we were kind of starting out, you know, years ago, trying to kind of get more into the industry, into that world. The best way to get comedians to want to be your friend is to have a show that they can be on. And so we were like, okay, well, we we definitely want to start a show. We want to have like a regular thing that we're doing to kind of like stretch the muscle. We didn't want to just do another variety show. We didn't want to just do another stand-up show where we have stand-ups on and then that's the whole show. Although those are great and we I love going to those. But we wanted to have kind of a hook that would make our show, you know, more interesting in your choice of shows to see in the entire metro area, you know, you might be more interested in seeing something where there's like a cool hook, like a mental health professional who could come on and answer your question rather than just a regular kind of stand-up show. And it ended up being one of our passion projects that we really loved doing over the course of several years. We kind of stopped doing it for couple reasons here and there um but we definitely want to start doing it again at some point nice now we're going to talk about some other things tell me about that one time during covid where you had bodies strewn all over your apartment (laughs) yeah thank you so one of my favorite credits that i have one that i'm more proud of than a lot of my other credits is uh that i was the official puppet fabricator for Ice-T's music video for the Hate is Real song. So deep in 2020, I wasn't doing anything else. I am like the friend of the friend group who can sew. I have a sewing machine. My mom taught me to sew when I was 10 or 11. I've made my Halloween costumes every year. I really like doing it. And so that's kind of what I was occupying my time with over the pandemic. A friend of a friend uh, is a director, animator, editor, filmmaker person. And he heard about this contest that Ice-T was having for his new music video, The Hate for The Hate is Real. And he was like, I have this idea to like make the band into puppets. 
And I really think I can win if I, you know, am able to execute this idea, but I don't have a sewing machine. I don't know anyone who sews. And I certainly don't want to hire like a real puppet fabrication house because that would be like several thousands of dollars per puppet. And so our mutual friend was like, oh, well, I know someone who has a sewing machine. I know someone who sews. And if you toss her like a few hundred bucks, I'm sure she'll do it. And that is what ended up happening. So cut to like two weeks later and he's dead dropping like a trash bag full of felt (laughs) at my apartment. And then, yeah, I have for like two weeks, I had these felt bodies strewn across my living room floor because they are flesh colored. And so I would just have these like naked felt bodies on my living room. That is hilarious. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Hey, Streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. Introducing Loom Stupid, where fashion meets quirkiness. Whether you're looking for statement tees that spark conversations or funky pieces that add whimsy to your outfit, Loom Stupid has got you covered. Join the fashion revolution and express your unique style with Loom Stupid. Visit our exclusive website at www.loomstupid.com and discover a world of fashion that's brilliantly bizarre and undeniably chic. New designs are being added all the time. Loomstupid.com Get your whimsy on with Loom Stupid. Because being silly is the new stylish. Let's get back into it. Okay, let's talk about Take Care of Emily. What is Take Care of Emily? Tell me about that. That is a movie. That's actually, that's another one of my credits that I'm very proud of. That is from writer-director Nick Rapuano. He's wonderful. You work with him a lot, don't you? Uh, I've worked with him twice before, but yeah, I guess in the, yeah, in the industry, that's a lot. I was in his debut feature. He had done like short films and plays up to that point. And then there's an open call. I auditioned and he cast me in his feature. Was that Route 80? Mm-hmm. Okay. And then after that came out, that got really great reviews. We just didn't have like a marketing budget or like a film festival budget, you know? And so it, it didn't really get played very much, but he was like, I really have, I have a great idea for my next feature. And it's about two sisters. And I really want you to be in it. And I also, I would love help writing it because I want to write about two sisters. And, you know, I don't really know. I'm not a woman. <laughs> I want to, I want some of the female perspective. And I was like, okay, great. And like over the course of several months, we kind of like wrote it back and forth and we got something that the both of us are really proud of. And then, yeah, we, we cast it and I play um, the older sister to Emily So you were taking care of Emily? I was the one taking care of Emily. Yeah. It's more of like a character tableau. It's definitely a character-driven piece about these two sisters. The older sister, Autumn, who I played, and then the younger sister, Emily. Like, their parents die, and Autumn is old enough to become, like, the legal guardian of Emily. Sounds like every Disney movie. Go ahead. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, Disney loves a dead mom disney loves they 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 love that they love to leave the kids alone (laughs) get rid of them kill them off and so it's just kind of about juggling what it's like to be the sister and the parent to a younger sister who's like only six years younger than you it's a good movie it's very low budget where would somebody find it amazon prime i think you can watch it oh okay stream it yeah all right cool red well let's move on to for sale Yeah. So tell me about For Sale. Are you a medium? Yes. I play a media. So it's like a horror comedy. A real estate agent is given a house that nobody else can sell. I wonder why. It's because it's haunted. And so the real estate agent hires me and I play a medium. That's weird because in Beetlejuice and Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, that house sold fast. Yeah. I mean, it was like an old Victorian. I mean, like, yeah, the premise, like, If you don't think too hard about it, I mean, like, it's a gorgeous, like, old mansion. I think, honestly, for some people, the fact that it's haunted might even be a plus. Like, they would pay more for that. If you don't think too hard about the premise itself, it's a fun movie. Was this the film, 
that you rode a bicycle uphill to a cemetery to do a screen test for? No. Or no, is that not that film? Is that Condor's Nest? How do you know about that? <laughs> I'm magic because I was at that cemetery. It's Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. And I was not there that day, but I I have been to that cemetery, which is weird because I'm not from New York. (laughs) But when I heard that story, I was like, holy shit, I've been to that cemetery. It's, I mean, it's an iconic cemetery in Brooklyn. It's like of all the cemeteries in Brooklyn, that's like, I think if not the biggest one, like the one that everyone's heard of, it's got like the most lore around it. Sure. There's this famous headstone it's been replicated like i don't know 80 times or something all over the world and one of the or maybe even two of those replicas are in that cemetery and my wife a while back we decided we had too much stuff so we were like stop you know like let's just stop buying stuff and let's just do experiences and so we found this particular headstone that has some personal meaning Mm -hmm. and it turns out that it's been replicated all over the place and blah 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 so Every once in a while, we'll go on these trips just to go see a, a different one of the replicas, you know, kind of like try we're collecting them all like they're Pokemon or whatever. But mm-hmm. that's why we were there. It was a few years ago. Uh, it was before COVID. And that cemetery is huge yeah, and big. beautiful. So tell me about that audition process, because I know it was long. It was weird. Yeah, it was like. I mean, definitely unlike any other audition process I've had, aside from like, you know, the self tapes and everything. So deep in 2020, I think actually relatively early in that year, I submitted myself. It was an open call. I submitted myself for this role who is a German Jewish woman who has since become a spy since World War II and like is a Nazi hunter, basically. Um, And I was like, this sounds absolutely crazy. Why not? You know, I could play German. I submitted myself. Weeks later, I had already forgotten about it. I ended up getting a self-tape. I sent in a tape. And then they were like, send in this other scene. I was like, okay. And then I think I sent in a third tape. At that point, it had been a few weeks. And I was like, all right, this is crazy. (laughs) Like, either cast me in it or not. And then they were like, okay, we're doing final callbacks. And we're going to come to New York. It was shot in Greensboro, North Carolina, funnily enough, which is like the town over from me in Winston-Salem. And they were like, we don't have a studio space. So is there like a park near you that we could go? You're like, well, I was like, well, well, I live really close to Prospect Park. And I suggested that I've been there too. Sorry. That's my favorite park in New York. And I still live, we still live really close to it. But he was like, well, I don't want to do a public park because I feel like that will be really full kind of in the middle of the day on a weekend. So it looks like Greenwood Cemetery is next to it. I feel like that will have less people. And I was like, you don't know anything about Greenwood Cemetery, but okay. (laughs) It's like full. There's people in it constantly. He was like, let's do Greenwood Cemetery. And I was like, okay, (laughs) I really wanted it because we couldn't do it in a studio space. And he wanted to like be safe because of COVID. And so there I was like, if you know anything about Brooklyn, it's impossible to get from anywhere in Brooklyn to anywhere else in Brooklyn on public transportation. It's like easier to get to Manhattan if you're in Brooklyn than it is to get anywhere else in Brooklyn. And so the bus would have taken me like 45 minutes. I could have walked there in the same amount of time. But I was like, well, you know, I don't want to leave an hour early because I was already so close to it. So I rode my bike, but I forgot that it is up a hill it was like east or it was like west and then north of me so I was like biking up a hill in my outfit that I had chosen to audition in which was like a blazer and jeans it was like late May early June it was (laughs) so hot outside I was biking uphill I was sweating I was like well (laughs) I had a backpack with like my sides in it and everything I do my audition I yell a lot I speak German in the middle of this park everybody's looking at one point we were at like the northernmost like main entrance which has like a bell tower and at one point I think it hit like four or five o'clock or something. And the bell just started banging constantly in the middle of the tape. And so we were like, anyway, <laughs> and so we just like made small talk for like truly, I think 10 minutes while this bell was chiming. Cause I think the park w- or the, the cemetery itself was closing down. And so it was like, everybody get out. It was, it was very strange. And then like, I didn't hear anything for two weeks. <laughs> and then I got an email that I got it. Very strange. 
I love that story. Yeah. That is so hilarious. Thanks. Okay, now we're going to talk about the real thing. Yeah. There is a movie. Mm-hmm. It's out. It's out. It's called Saturday Night. Yes. You play a real life person. Mm-hmm. You play Valerie Bromfield. Yeah. Now, the funny thing about her, one of the funny things about her, uh, besides the fact that she's a comedian, funny, mm-hmm. see what I did there, mm-hmm. is that she retired from comedy to do a, a psychiatric thing or a, a whatever. Mm-hmm. And that was your minor, yeah? Huh, yeah. Sort of ish. Yeah. How, how weird are you? I mean, how weird is that? I know. We both have like pursuits within that, within the psych, you know, psychology world. She teaches, I think, psychology at a university in, I want to say, Tennessee or something like that. Yeah. No, I looked it up. I don't think she's there anymore now. She just seems to be doing a private practice thing. I don't think she's involved with the university. But yeah, let's talk about Saturday Night. It's Mm -hmm. directed and written, I believe, by uh, Jason Reitman. Mm -hmm. And Gil Keenan. Thank you. How did you become involved in this project? And had you ever heard of the character? Because it's a real life Mm -hmm. person. Had you ever heard of this person before you auditioned? I had not. No. Like a lot of people. She dropped off from the industry and she never really kind of became a household name like a lot of people from that show. I'm so glad I got to learn about her because she's got such a fascinating life and career. And I think like being in, you know, your mid 50s and changing your career and changing your priorities and like going back to school and trying something completely different is, I think, so cool. But no, I I hadn't heard of her before this. And I got involved in the project, you know, in the conventional way. My manager sent me the audition. I sent in a tape. They had me in for a callback. This was like May of last year. And so it was supposed to film last September. And that didn't end up happening. But I didn't hear anything for months and months afterwards. So I I thought that was, you know, just another audition that didn't happen, didn't go, you know, And then February of this year is when I got the call. Like, they didn't have me come back in and audition again. They were just like, you got it. I auditioned, I got a call back, and then eight to ten months later, I think, however that math works, I got it. So how long was it from the time you auditioned to the time that the film came out? From the time I auditioned to the time the film came out? Well, we wrapped in, like, May of this year. Oh, snap. Yeah, and so it was like... It's a very quick turnaround, especially for a movie of this caliber. Like typically movies are shot and then it's like a couple years sometimes before they even have a wide release. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, this was very, very quick. And so I would say like just about a year and a half in terms of like we I was filming like almost exactly a year after I auditioned and then it came out like six months after that, (laughs) which is crazy. Wow, that is really, really fast. Yeah. Maybe it's because there's not a ton of CGI in it. (laughs) Yeah, there's very little effects in there. And I think they also wanted it to come out during the 50th season of SNL. It's 49 years, but 50 seasons. So I think they wanted to do something in conjunction with that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, no better time to strike, right? So you can't wait for the next 50. (laughs) What was your favorite part about being on that set oh first of all where was it filmed i know it was it at 30 rock no the exteriors were filmed all in new york but then the majority of the movie was filmed in a huge studio in trillith studios which is in fayetteville georgia which is a good like hour 45 minutes away from anything (laughs) like the closest walmart you had to get in a car and like drive 20 minutes Trillith is where they shoot all like the Marvel DC stuff down in Georgia. Gotcha. Yollywood, as it's called. (laughs) I like that. I haven't heard that before. That's where we shot it. I don't know. I don't think I can pick like one favorite piece from being on set. Like everything, like I can't say enough good things about being in that movie. Like it really was like one of the best sets I've ever been on. Like the most talented people I've ever worked with. And like everyone was so sweet and nice and kind. And like getting to hang out with my main co-star is Nick Padani, who plays Billy Crystal. All my scenes are with him. And so like, you know, becoming friends with him and, you know, and getting to know and becoming friends with other folks in the cast was like so amazing. Yeah. 
It was awesome. Is this the biggest budget film you've been a part of or project? Yes, definitely. What do you think is the biggest difference in, I guess, different budget sized projects? What's the biggest difference? I don't know. It's all the little things like there's more food, (laughs) I guess. I've heard that food is like kind of the biggest difference. It's one of the bigger differences. I mean, like on smaller budget things, like they can't afford like even crafty, like catering. They they don't have like someone come in and do like buffet style. They do like, okay, we'll order from this diner and that's what you get, you know, like, which I mean, it's, hey, free lunch is free lunch. But I mean, there are also more people like the cast was huge, but also like behind the camera, like below the line folks, there's like giant departments, like multi tens of people in one department. Yeah, like the scale, like getting driven to set in a hired van as opposed to like some guy's cousin's car, you know, like big differences. Was it intimidating? Yes, very much so. I felt the whole time like I'm ruining it. (laughs) I don't know. I was like, why am I here? And this is crazy. I can't believe like, do they know? Do they know like who I am? Obviously, they don't. You were waiting for them to find out that you're an imposter. That was a fraud. Yeah. I was like, I can't believe that there must be some mistake. After we wrapped, I was like, they're definitely cutting me out. They're cutting me out of the movie. Like, it won't make sense. Like, none of Billy Crystal scenes will make sense. But like, they're cutting me out. They're like, she's ruining it. They're, I'm definitely not going to be in it. I am in the movie. I am there. So they didn't do that, which was nice. They just replace you with a puppet. Yeah. <laughs> Very Billy much Crystal's like, yeah. a puppet the whole time. <laughs> So how do you think it turned out? I'm, I know you've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it a couple times now. I love it. It's so much fun. It wasn't as nerve wracking to watch because I was like, I'm not really in it a lot. You know, I have a small role and I am there for sure. But there's so much going on in that movie that I wasn't there when they were shooting. And like, you know, I don't know how things translated from you know, the script to the screen. And so I was really excited actually to see this one. And like, I don't know, it's like, it's so fun. It's so good. It's like, you have to watch it with friends. You should definitely watch it in a theater. It's and like, you get a lot out of it from multiple watches because so much happens. Did you get the whole script or did you just get your, your sides? No, we got the whole script. Oh, wow. Yeah. I have to imagine that if you're in it a little bit less then. When you're watching it, you get to actually enjoy the movie instead of just critique your performance for two hours. (laughs) Yeah, pretty much. Well, that is the raddest. Yeah. Okay, now this is a touchy subject, so you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But would you ever work with Jason Reitman again? Ugh, no. I'm She said no, Jason. (laughs) Are you sorry? We got I was gonna I was gonna bring him out. Yeah, I was gonna bring him out, but Oh my God. Yes. In a heartbeat. Yeah. Not only is he like an, a fantastic director, it was really great working with him. It He like assembled a team of people who are all fantastic, who are all like incredible at their jobs. And he just, he does something that I really love, which is that he like trusts them to just do their job. Well, you hired him for a reason, right? Exactly. Well, there are so many people. There are a lot of directors who are yes, there are control freak who cannot trust anybody to do the job that they were hired to do that they are professionals at and do all the time. He really was just like even in performance, he was like he really wanted to see what we brought to it. And if he had an adjustment, he was very specific about what he was looking for, which is so helpful. Like there are a lot of directors who are lovely and great people, but they don't really have a vision or like they do have a vision, but they they can't. It's it's difficult for them to communicate with. And like I've worked with a lot of really lovely directors and, and great directors, and he is up there in the top. The people that he works with, he's been working with for like 20 years and like that's like the sign of a really great person because people are like willing to stick with him and work with him again. Like they like working with him. I I think that's, you know, that's great. I think that is an integral part of a long lasting career in any business. Absolutely. Yeah. I've never seen a a Jason Reitman movie that I did not enjoy. So I, I'm so looking forward to seeing this film. Yeah. 
even if it's not as popular, even if it's not a hit, he like doesn't do a bad job, you know, like, I do think that's something that like more casual movie fans like have trouble recognizing, like if they haven't heard of it, it must not be good or something like that. So it's, it's definitely worth taking a look at his oeuvre. Ooh, well, what a great word to go out on. <laughs> yeah. Corinne, tell everybody where they can find you on social media and don't tell me to cop and paste anything. You've listened to other interviews that I've done. I am going to have to unfortunately tell you to copy paste. Like, everyone in my life, as long as I've lived, has had difficulty spelling my name. They understand it from an intellectual standpoint. But like when it comes to actually like typing it out, it's like, which one is double? Which one are the double letters? It's very difficult. You can find me on Instagram. That's like pretty much the main thing is Instagram. Corinne Stagramster on Instagram. If you type in Corinne Brady slash most likely copy paste Corinne Brady from the title of this episode or wherever it is in the description into Instagram, I will come up. When I was typing out my notes and I was trying to spell your name, I couldn't figure out where the Q went. Mm -hmm. It's silent. It's, it's a silent Q. Yeah, it's silent. And so listeners, you can put the Q wherever you want because it's silent. I don't care how you spell it. Again, I'm not going to hunt you down. You've played a Nazi hunter, <laughs> not a speller hunter. Yeah, only on TV or whatever, only in the movies. Corinne, I know this is a weird question, but is there anything we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you about that you specifically wanted to cover today? Did we get the big bits? We got the big bits. Yeah, I don't know. There's nothing. I don't know. Anything else that you wanted to ask me? I don't have. I think I'm good. <laughs> but, well, I guess I do want to ask you one question. Okay. The next time you're promoting something, would you care to come back? I would love to. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. I will actually call your people. Please call my people. I'll call your people. <laughs> Corinne, Brittany, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic, I don't know, bicycling uphill both ways mm -hmm. to an to I have, do an I have audition. I'm on a bike right after this. Yeah. <laughs> I just think that's hilarious that you auditioned in a cemetery. Yeah, it really was. As it was happening, I was like, this is insane. <laughs> this is, You're all, this is gonna be a great podcast. This story. Is, I truly, I was like, this is gonna be a great story one day once it's over. Right now, I hate that I'm living it. <laughs> so that's gonna be one of those stories that you tell on Jimmy Kimmel or Jimmy Fallon or any of the other Jimmys. <laughs> if any one of the many Jimmys people want to call me, I got some anecdotes. What can I say? I love it. Corinne, thank you so much. You have a great rest of your week, and uh, I will see you next time. Hey, you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Opening music is the song FSP Theme, written, performed, and provided by Ambush Vin. Closing music is from the song Say My Name, off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems, used with permission from Jax Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening. <laughs>